어, 여러분 안녕하십니까? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As we uh, witness, the presentation was a uh, trilingual, which means uh, Korean and British English <laughs> and American English. So I think I have to go through uh, bilingual, which is Korean and an Asian English. Uh, the, uh, it is my great pleasure to take the duty of a moderator this afternoon, and I would like to welcome all of you home and abroad to this uh, discussion session. Uh, first of all, let me outline what we are going to do this afternoon. Basically, this is Q&A question between speakers and audience. So first, maybe a couple of, uh, a couple of common questions raised up that is uh, directing to all of the speakers, which means uh, all of you are supposed to respond to. And maybe a couple of uh, specific questions which direct to maybe individual speaker. And then maybe uh, if the time allows, we are, we're going to have some uh, open-ended questions brought up from the floor. I expect what is going on. Um, the aim of this session is to share knowledge and opinions on the subjects addressed by the speakers. And uh, it's quite natural, not incidentally, the common keyword of three pre tre presentation was uh, a systems approach, which is again very natural because as uh, the issues getting bigger and bigger in, in, in terms of uh, scale and widens in terms of uh, scope and uh, more complex and multilateral in terms of uh, dimension, the systems approach is quite natural. So based on that uh, common uh, keyword, let me sum up uh, the presentation very shortly. The first uh, Deputy Secretary General Douglas France of OECD uh, talked about the, the entitled The Promise and Peril of the New Technology Revolution. Let me go back to the... He introduced the, uh, the, the so-called Going Digital Project, which is uh, carried out by the, now being carried out by the OECD. And the second uh, presentation was by Vice President Luke Georgia from the University of Manchester, entitled Implication of an Innovation Ecosystems Approach for Policy Design, which is about the, uh, the ongoing EU project. Am I right? IIT, Innovation, Innovation and what? Industrial, In, industrial Innovation and In Transition, yeah. Uh, and lastly, the Vice President Zhang Wanli talked about the Asante policy for the next uh, decade, which uh, all of them are very uh, timely and relevant and constructive. Uh, so now maybe it's time to uh, go to the Q&A question. I have a list of questions here. I'm sorry. We are now uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary of STEPI uh, for the life cycle of uh, living things. Uh, 30 years means a, a generation and at its, its time time. So uh, this is a generation shift is going on. At the same time, the paradigm shift is going on. And based on that change, the first qu question was, uh, even though all speakers already partly addressed to that issue, what do you think is the biggest or most drastic change or difference that could be 
for the next 30 years as compared to the last 30 years. Maybe it could be a technological or so, social, social or, or maybe a, a technological. And related to the first question is that changing uh, situation, what is going to be the direction or principle of the governmental role or public sector's role? That is the first common question, again, directing to all of you speakers. I expect uh, maybe uh, first from so that the Professor Luke Georgia sitting uh, on my left, and then, and then. So I, I could answer the question in, in two ways. I mean, if, if the question was just about uh, um, technology, uh, I, I think probably we, we are on the, the cusp of a, a bio-revolution led by genomics and precision medicine. It's been a long time coming. Most of these things come later than we expect. We had the same with ICT, but I, I expect we will see more drive coming from that sector and also extending into manufacturing through, through in industrial biotechnology. Uh, if I switch to social mode, I, I think we, we, we don't have to look to the future, we just have to look to the present to see that uh, we have been concerned probably in this past 30 years with general uh, wealth creation through, through globalization and other means and we have left behind distributional issues and our, uh, most of our societies have reached breaking point. So the big social challenge is to bring back uh, in, into the frame those people who have been left behind. Ditto. Um, I, I agree that I think the biggest change we'll see in the next 30 years is is the social impact of the technology revolution. I think that we're at a critical, potentially breaking point now when you look at nations that are putting nationalism back on the table, protectionism back on the table. You see efforts to weaken the European Union structure. I think we run the risk of reversing 70 years of prosperity and relative peace if we don't get it right now. And what that entails for me, as I tried to say in my speech, is, is that as we move forward, we have to be inclusive. We have to have governments that are willing and able to pass and implement policies that diminish the winner-take-all philosophy that governs so much of, that is, is, is reasserting itself. At the, at the OECD, I, I think we're an example of, of being on the cusp of this change, or at least facing this new challenge. The, 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 the OECD grew out of the Marshall Plan, which rebuilt Europe after World War II, and that plan is based on open borders, transparent government, rule of law, and democracy. And many of those values are now under assault. And I think that, that nothing else is going to work if we don't get this social inclusion and inclusive growth right. Because if we allow this divide between the haves and the have-nots to continue to widen, then we're going to see the continued political turmoil that, that, is, that is stretching across the, the globe, both in rich countries and poor countries. And the last thing that I would say, since this is a nicely open-ended um, uh, question, I also think that corruption is a huge issue. And if we don't get corruption right, None of this, none of the rest of this progress will work, you know. So I think social inclusion and pro and, and and progress against corruption 
fighting corruption. I think those are the two main challenges facing us. And they're, they're technological, but they're also social. Yeah. 앞으로 어떤 변화가 올 거냐라는 두분 말씀하신 부분하고 저도 생각이 비슷한데요. 제가 그 자꾸 30주년이다 보니까 옛날 얘기를 하게 되는데 제가 94년도에 스태피 입사를 했는데 그 당시에 과학기술의 목표들은 대부분 국가 계획을 세우면 G7 뭐 수준 그 다음에 그 GDP 만불, 이만 불 계속 이렇게 해서 저희가 목표를 잡았던 것 같아요. 그런데 그러면서 고민이 잘 사는 나라가 되는 게 목표는 당연한데 잘 산다는 의미가 뭘까라는 게 이제 좀 옛날하고 생각이 달라진 거죠. 잘 산다는 게 우리나라가 GDP 이거는 저희 영, 젊은 연구원이 던졌던 질문이기도 한데. GDP 3만 불이 국민한테 무슨 의미가 있을까요? 라는 질문이 있었습니다. 그러니까 국민들한테는 잘 사는 게 중요한 거지 GDP가 2만 불, 3만 불 되는 게 중요한 건 아닌 것 같아요. 그럼 잘 산다는 게 뭘까라는 고민이 아까 이제 말씀하신 어떤 사회적인 소셜 챌린지들을 어떻게 해결할 거냐 갈등을 어떻게 풀 거냐 이런 부분들까지 혁신 정책이 같이 담아야 되겠다라는 게 어떻게 보면은 저희가 생각하는 과학기술 혁신 정책의 변화이기도 하고 변화에 대한 수요이기도 한것 같습니다. 이에 따라서 아마 그 글로벌라이제이션하고 내셔널리즘 간의 어떤 문제들, 어떤 밸런스나 이런 부분도 저도 공감을 하는 부분이고요. 결국은 정부가 어떻게 달라져야 되느냐, 정부의 역할이 어떻게 달라져야 되느냐라는 부분에 있어서는 불확실성이 높아지는 게 확실한 거죠. 그러니까 불확실성은 계속 높아질 거다라고 본다면 최소한 다른 나라는 모르겠습니다만은 한국 정부에 있어서는 그 동안 너무 어 미시적인 관리, 마이크로 매니지먼트 쪽이 정부가 너무 많은 비중을 두고 일을 해왔다. 이런 그렇지만 불확실성이 높아질 때 정부가 해야 될 일이라는 것은 전략을 세우는 겁니다. 그러니까 보다 중장기적인 전략을 갖고 어 정책을 이끌어가는 것이 더 중요하다라는 생각을 들고요. 그러니까 그게 이제 정부의 역할이 달라져야 될 부분이라고 생각이 들고 그 중에 하나가 어떻게 보면은 지금 이 과학기술 혁신과 관련해서 나타나고 있는 여러 가지 수요들. 에 대한 포트폴리오 스트라테지를 어떻게 가져갈 거냐라는 게 정부가 가장 고민해야 될 부분이 아닐까라는 생각입니다. Okay, uh, moving to the next question. By taking the privilege of chairman, I have a couple of questions, which is again very common. Uh, the back to the going digital project of OECD. By nature, the effect of digital economy is Dual, which means the benefit and cost, and the promise and perils, and uh, it also has a duality, in the sense that uh, the the between the haves and have-nots, and the, between the digital literacy and the illiteracy, and uh, you are maybe uh, looking for the harmonization among uh, member countries. Again, back to the IIT project again. It also pursues the collaboration among uh, EU member countries. Uh, these tasks maybe sound uh, ideal and fantastic in, in conceptual sense, but it's going to be uh, very challenging, even uh, infeasible in the reality. So my question is what uh, challenges and obstacles you think uh, you will be coming up uh, throughout the project. And uh, eventually, you expect uh, to end up with uh, uh, consensus or, or, or discrepancy among member countries. You, so you, you first. Well, I think all of us who are involved in the Going Digital project 
And anyone who works at a consensus-based multilateral organization understands that there will always be challenges, there will always be obstacles to harmonizing um, viewpoints. But I think the OECD and this project are at a good starting point because there is a high degree of like-mindedness around the 35 uh, members of our, of our uh, council. They're all deeply interested in this project. They all recognize that the time to get out in front of this revolution, of these changes, is now. They have an opportunity to be proactive in terms of their policies. And the minister I mentioned in my talk, you know, was, was, was very clear about this, very clear about the practical problems that, they fa that he faces in, in, in confronting a digital economy. And he's looking to the OECD for help. And I think all of the 35 members, what I'm hearing, and they're all surprisingly, this is, this is like a Christmas tree and everybody wants to hang an ornament on it at the OECD. I don't think there's any country that hasn't expressed a strong willingness to be involved and to help manage the, prob the, the pro project. Now that, that can present its own problems with 35 different managers. That can be a little tough, but, but I think there is a, a unified sense that we need to go forward and face the challenges, which are very real. Um, for instance, data localization is one. Um, there are, I said in, in my speech, we need to follow the data. Well, following the data involves prying the data out of companies that see it as a pri proprietary issue. It needs to be pried out of national governments where they tend to want to protect it for other reasons. So that's a big obstacle that I see. So our job in the next two years is to develop the strongest possible rationale for how coming to a common standard, a framework, a set of guidelines will bring the biggest benefits of the digital economy and the, and the technology revolution to the broadest number of people. And, and we've done that in the past. I mean, the, the OECD, against strong odds, created the anti-bribery convention. We created the multinational, the uh, guidelines for multinational enterprises. We've created responsible business conduct guidelines. And th these are all soft law. But, but if you reach a consensus and if there is a belief that these are the best standards for countries that want to move forward in a progressive, efficient way and grow their economies, I think that if you, if you make that case, then we'll overcome almost all of those obstacles. What about communication between directories? I hear the 10 directories are participating in that project. This is quite good. Yeah. Um, I've worked in big bureaucracies before. I worked at the, at the State Department. I worked in the US Senate. Um, newspapers are flat. There's really very little bureaucracy, but these other two, the Senate and particularly the State Department, are, are big bureaucracies. It's hard to get people to play together. Um, it's easy to say we want to break down the silos, we want to work together collaboratively, but it's very hard because people have their turf. They think that they know best. They don't necessarily want interlopers. And at the OECD, these issues are compounded by something I've never confronted before, which is about half of our budget is paid by the dues of our 35 members. The other half comes from what we call voluntary contributions. And those come from foundations and governments, and they come to specific directorates. And we have some directorates that run 60, 70 percent of their budget on these voluntary contributions. So they're always in competition with each other. So our job with this project is through the leadership of the STI team and An Andy Wyckoff, whom I, I think you may, you may know, who's the director of STI, is to convince everyone, and, and, and Secretary General Gurria has been great at this too, convince everyone that it is in our interest and it's only gonna work if we play together well. And if we, so we've, we've taken all the money from this and we're controlling it centrally through STI, but we're doling it out to projects based on merit. 
And so that means people are gonna put their best foot forward, they're gonna work collaboratively, and every project that's getting funded through the Going Digital program has to involve at least two directorates, and preferably four or five, because that will increase your chances of getting more money from that central pot. You know, that's a, that's a very practical and realistic way to try and make this work. The, uh, Professor George, what is going on in the EU? Is it conflict uh, or, or differences between members? Or? Well, um, I mean, maybe to start at um, a, a general level, uh, the, the EU clearly is facing a major challenge from the perception of its value to uh, what is in most countries you would call a, a substantial minority of citizens. I mean, the, the UK, for a while, it was a slight majority. I'm not sure it is a majority anymore, but there we are. Uh, so UK why, is a yeah, why, why, why is this, um, why, why has this trust been, been lost. I mean, let, let me give you an example. I was getting a taxi from Brussels Airport two weeks ago, and my taxi driver spent the whole journey telling me the EU takes all our taxes and we have nothing to show for it. And this was a man probably whose entire livelihood is based on people coming and going to the Commission. So, so, um, so th there are these same segments of the population that we were discussing in, in relation to the the, the, the previous question. So there is a, a broad challenge that the EU needs to demonstrate it, its, its value to, to, to those people and uh, build its policies accordingly. So let, let's come to the, uh, the areas of uh, research and innovation. Uh, here too, there, there are tensions. I mean, first of all, if we look at science, what's called the, the excellence program, uh, the EU has been very successful in building the European Research Council to be a, a true, what we call, Champions League of, of, of excellence. But there has been a constant pressure from the countries that perform poorly, mainly in Eastern Europe, to change the basis of that distribution to be more geographical rather than straightforward competition. And, of course, that would be the end of the excellence criteria. And you can't, you can't combine the two in, in a... In a, in a single um, in a single instrument in in this way, and the people who run that program are are concerned that the if if the UK withdraws from it, it's not clear whether the UK will be in European research programs or not in them. This is still an open question. But if the UK withdraws, the the balance towards excellence could shift. So uh, the, the typically the the, the northern research intensive countries feel that the weight might move against them. So that's one area. Uh, however, when we come to the uh, more uh, applied area, which is the, 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 the larger side of the budget, um, here I think the European Union programs have not succeeded in demonstrating their value to citizens, even if they have been valuable. And uh, my opinion and the opinion of some of my fellow people on advisory committees, for example, are uh, the, the RISE committee, which advises the Research and Innovation Commissioner, uh, another member here, Matthias Weber, as well. We, um, we have been uh, pushing towards the need for a much more mission-oriented approach to these programs with, with clear and measurable deliverables, and this will be a, a better way to communicate to citizens. We went halfway with societal challenges but still they were very dispersed. They were not delivery focused. And Europe does well when it is delivery focused, you know, with our space program, the Airbus and so on. When there is a project where you know where you're going, it somehow seems to be a, a capability that works. So uh, I believe this is the direction. Uh, just to finish, you, as you mentioned, the IIT project, for, for companies, Europe is, is, is an environment. I mean, there are very few who are really dependent on it as a source of innovation uh, support. Uh, they are very concerned, though, that Europe provides the right regulatory uh, environment favorable to uh, innovation. So, um, and with that, the, the kind of scale of market I was talking about earlier that would allow the region to be competitive. I have a huge backlog of uh, 
anonymous questions coming from the floor. So let's go through some of them. Now we are uh, in the midst of, midst of uh, terminology jungle. So the first question goes to the, uh, Dr. Franz. What is the difference between the so-called digital revolution and the fourth industrial revolution? Everyone is very, very confused. Well, when the moderator started, he said we had a lot of knowledge and a lot of opinions. I have more opinions than knowledge, but as I, as I see it, as we perceive it there, the next production revolution, which is what the OECD calls uh, the Industrial Revolution or, or Indus Industry 4.0, in Schwab's term, um, that involves more biotechnology and more advanced materials. Um, I was at a conference in Stockholm a few months ago and got a really strong example of what the next production revolution is like when a guy from a, a, a Swedish forestry company came up on stage and he had a sack and he put the paper, this paper sack down on his table and he pulled out a small tree about this high and that's what they used to do. And then he pulled out a paper container for milk, which is one of the things they do. And then he pulled out a jar that had an ear in it, an ear, a human ear made with nanomaterials, bio, with, with biomaterials. That's where they're going now. That to me is the, the next production revolution. Now, digital underpins that. Digital underpins it, as I said, but, but I think, I think, they're, I think they're, slight, they're slightly separate. And, you know, the digital is all the things that we digitize. It's all the things that are data-driven, but that data gets turned into real products through new materials, through nanotechnology, through biotechnology, through advanced materials, and so I, I think that's that's where I draw try to draw the line between them. But but I don't, it may be a distinction without a difference too, you know. In in terms of what we what we really should be looking at is is what is the combined impact, whatever we call this, in the real world. What's the impact on society, um, and and what issues does that impact raise? Three D printing is a perfect example of where those two things come together. I think you need all you need data, reams and reams, terabytes and terabytes of data to print something with a 3D printer. But you also need new materials to make it work. But that raises a whole other question about consumer protection and who's responsible if that 3D printed car part or airplane part fails. You know, so I, th I think these things are all intertwined. It's not a really good answer because I don't think there's a real distinct difference. So I'm probably as confused as the audience. Yeah, I'm confused too. The next question uh, goes to uh, Professor Georgia. Again, back to the IIT project which comprises four components, science, technology, and uh, the people, finance, service, and uh, knowledge flow. Am I right? Would you just set a priority among those four components? That is the question. Well, I, I, I think the, the main point of a an ecosystem perspective is that you can't uh, have local optima. You have to try to make the whole system work. So if you uh, um, try to focus on, on only on only one of those in a in a true priority sense, you would reach some bottlenecks uh, pretty quickly. But I think the perspective also tells us that we we can't easily tell in, in advance always where those bottlenecks are. So we may have to work on, a, on an experimental and interactive approach to, to get it right. Um, uh, having said all that, I did put up a slide which showed that companies 
uh, particularly prioritized access to knowledge as, as core for innovation when, when they were asked to, to set a, a, a priority. I mean, that may not mean it's the most pressing policy problem, because they might already have it, but they certainly think it's important. Next one goes to uh, Dr. Franz. You mentioned about uh, the three pillars of uh, going digital projects. And in that regard, this is a very specific question. What is the difference between so-called creative destruction, which is coined by the George Schumpeter, and the digital transformation? Any difference between creative, creative destruction? and digital transformation? I get all the easy questions. Um, I don't know. I'll be honest, I could make up something, but I don't know exactly, I don't know, because I'm not sure what creative destruction means. I'm, I understand what disruption is, and I understand the role of disruption in the digital transformation, but I don't know what creative destruction is. It's, it's what my, my, my two-year-old granddaughter does, but I don't know what it means in this technological uh, uh, world. I'm, I'm sorry, so maybe, maybe we could pass it down and do it. I don't know. Actually, about two years ago, we were 그 국제 심포지움을 할때 주제 중에 하나는 그 창조적 파괴가 아니고 파괴적 창조가 많다라는 주제가 한번 있었습니다. 룩소 때인가요? 아마 왔을 때 얘기한 것 같은데 반 그러니까 그때 의미는 어떻게 보면은 인류에게 도움이 되지 않는 혁신 활동이 굉장히 어떻게 보면은 많이 있다 이런 부분에 혁신 활동의 부작용을 얘기하면서 얘기한 건데요. 이제 여기서 아마 질문하신 여기 지금 피플 파워라는 분이 질문하신 거는 어 그거 그 얘기를 하신 것 같지는 않고 어 어떤 디지털 기술에 의해서 기존의 새로운 기존의 질서를 무너뜨리면서 새로운 걸 창조해서 그것이 어떤 부를 창출하거나 가치를 창출하는. 부분을 생각을 하신 것 같아요. 그래서 어떻게 보면은 최근에 일어나고 있는 이런 디지털 트랜스포메이션이 어, 슌페터가 얘기하는 그런 창조적 파괴의 뭐 저는 모습이라고 보고요. 단 어, 아까 이제 프란츠 차장께서도 계속 지적을 하셨듯이 이런 디지털화에 따르는 부작용 부분 이런 부분들이 있기 때문에 저는 파괴적 창조도 같이 고려를 해야 된다. 그러니까 뭐그 정도만 말씀을 드릴 수 있을 것 같습니다. I do have another one for you. <웃음> um, again, back to the uh, going digital project. The bottom line is, I think, the developing standard for a digital world. But the question is, is that really desirable? It may kill diversity and creativity of individuals. This is another concern of the, the, back, the back side of the, the project. Yeah. I think it's a, an excellent question. And I think the excellent answer is yes. Um, it is desirable. I mean, we, we need standards. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a little story. I first rolled out this analogy between nuclear weapons treaty and a framework for artificial intelligence in front of a tech audience in Washington in early March. Google was there, Facebook was there, um, Verizon, AT&T, and some others, and they about bit my head off because they have the concerns that are, you know, evident in, the, in this question. Will, will, it, will it damage creativity? Can you really control something like artificial intelligence? Or to go to Mark Zuckerberg's quote, you know, we don't want to make rules before, before we didn't make rules before the airplane learned to fly. But I, 
I think, I, I think, as I said with Zuckerberg, I think it begs the question. I think that we do need to develop standards, and we need to develop standards that grow out of an international conversation with all stakeholders as part of that conversation, including the tech community and the business community and everybody there. But we need to have standards because this is, is too fast-moving and too transformative to just leave it to business to decide or just leave it to a handful of governments to decide. I'll go back again to globalization. I mean, globalization was a great thing. And as I said, no place has benefited more than Asia from globalization. But we're seeing some real backlash, and some of that, and that backlash is not just because we haven't told the story of globalization well, it's because we've left people behind. It's because we didn't cushion the fall for the losers. And if we just allow the digital world to continue and say all we're looking for is creativity and diversity and, and innovation, then I think we risk, a very real risk, of widening that gap, perhaps irreparably, given the scope of the change that we face here. So yes, I think standards are vital. I think that's one of the things we're trying to do with the digital project at the OECD, is start the conversation. We're not gonna dictate the results. We're not gonna dictate the results here, but we're gonna develop a consensus on these standards, and I hope develop consensus that at least our 35 member countries, which are, are most of the leading leading economies in the world, you know that 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 they can come to adhere to, and that then by by they, them setting the standard, that will spread across the rest of the world. So yes, 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 we need them. I think. Okay, I think this is going to be the last question, because I have to be very punctual in ending this session, because we have a next schedule. This question goes to uh, Professor Georgia. Innovation ecosystem in the year of digitalization have maybe huge opportunities in cyberspace or communities you see any uh, specific concrete opportunities uh, in the near future in, in, in European countries? Um, uh, of course, there are huge opportunities, um, uh, uh, as we've already heard uh, the, uh, the other speakers say, in the uh, application of of data, or as some people like to call it, big data, and the ability to link across um, databases. Uh, it will help us achieve some key social goals if we can link across uh, uh, health and behavioral databases, for example, as well as giving important research insights. But at, at the same time, uh, it, it's good to see these business opportunities and they could manifest in many ways. I mean, another one is around Internet of Things. I know a, a strength in, in Korea. But all of them also contain some very significant challenges. I mean, uh, the, the, the more comprehensively we connect our data systems, the more at risk they are. And this puts a, a huge premium on cyber security. And I think that that is probably the, the absolute top priority if we are to have a successful uh, industrialization of cyberspace, we must make it far more secure than it is at the moment. Okay, this is really the, la the last question. Uh, again, back to the IID program. Could you introduce some, if any, uh, best practice programs to benchmark going on in Europe, uh, the, the eco, ecosystem policy. Any, any country or any program or something? I think, I think the, the, the answer is no, not in a, I mean, they may exist, but not to my knowledge. Um, 
uh, not not in a holistic sense. I mean, I think what we are seeing is is a reappraisal of what programmes should look like at the moment. It's go, it's going on at uh, e EU level. I think there's an expectation that the successor to Horizon 2020 will be looking quite different. Uh, it's going on in, in the UK with our debate on the industrial strategy. I've seen it in some other national environments. And maybe the, um, the, the, the point that's common to them is, is a much greater focus on a mission-oriented, as I mentioned earlier, or challenge-based uh, approach. Uh, the idea of being more clearly focused to delivery. I mean, this it, it, it's not a simple thing to do. I mean, there's even a complex taxonomy of, of, of challenges. There are those with defined goals, the kind of moonshot type ones, and there are challenges which are open-ended. Let me think, cure for cancer is an open-ended challenge. We, we will not know when we have reached that point because it is so, so multi-dimensional. But uh, uh, in general, that, that to me is the, the movement that we see going on in, in, in policies. Yeah, I'm bringing up this question because uh, so many people in Korea are uh, expecting the outcome of going digital project and IIT project in the near future. So please circulate when this comes out. If I could add, I mean, the OECD does a digital scoreboard on all of our countries, um, which is not necessarily a deep dive, but it's a pretty thorough look about where countries are in terms of their policy toward the digital economy. You know, and we rank them, and you know, so it's there, and it's certainly, as I, as I mentioned in, in talking about the Going Digital Project, measurement is a huge part of our challenge, and you know, if we don't know what's broken, we can't fix it, and so we're gonna be putting more and more of our resources into measuring so I think that benchmarking is necessary, not, not to name and shame countries, but to find out what the gap is between where we are and where we want to be. So we're doing some of that. We're at least, and, and we've been doing this digital scoreboard for a number of years now. And countries usually really like it, depending on where they stand. Can you expect uh, the outcome next Christmas? <laughs> too early? Well, we're, this is an unusual project in many ways for the OECD, and, that, and one of the, the, the aspects is that we're going to be rolling out papers and workshops and conferences across this two-year period. We're not burrowing in for two years to come up with some book this thick that nobody will ever really read. You know, so we're going to be producing products as we go along, and it's essential because these are such burning and urgent issues. And if we wait two years, the whole landscape will have changed anyway. So we'll, we'll have, we have a schedule now for things that will be coming out, and there's a lot of pressure on us to, 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 to do that. I think it's time to wrap up this session. And uh, as I said, uh, we are standing in the midst of a uh, paradigm shift in authentic policy. And uh, in that respect, the presentation of today were very timely and insightful and constructive. In that uh, regard, uh, it is my sincere duty to thank all of the speakers and all of the participants today. And please contribute to uh, the coming sessions up until the end of this symposium. And uh, finally, I congratulate President Song and all SNAP members uh, on his 30th anniversary, which is very, very monumental, meaningful, and especially to me, it gives a very, very big sentimental value because I used to be the member of SNAP. Why don't you uh, end up this session? Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you.